Hello, hi, howdy, cheers, everyone. Tin. You know, I was hoping this Spider's Den music would be a little bit more, uh... Well, I guess it's atmospheric. I want something that's a little bit... A little bit more crittery, but intense. Uh... Eh... Uh. Ooh, maybe Swamp Thing? No, a Dragon Rider. Let's do that. Hopefully that'll work. All right. So what kind of magic uh, is it when Falsa Doom uses a snake as an arrow? That could be uh, some sort of uh, nature magic or an animal specific. Uh, maybe in that world, that particular type of snake has a magical ability to, to be shot as an arrow. Red Trills, hey, it's good to see you, my friend. Uh, we are just beginning our next part of our our setup for NaNoWriMo here. We have we have discussed the genres, the subgenres of fantasy, and what is fantasy. We have discussed the setting. We have created the outline for it and a map as well. Um, we spent over nine thousand hours in MS Paint. Uh, for our reference, which actually produced a ton of story beats. Oh, super productive. Then we discussed magic systems and perhaps even how that might incorporate uh, into the concepts that we were brainstorming while sketching out a very simple map using paint. And... Don't don't think I don't see that Cthulhu out there, Rad Trills. I have the Call of Cthulhu uh, Keeper rulebook open, and I am not afraid to use it, my friend. <laughs> ah. You know what? There's some similarities there between the covers. I can't quite put my eye on it. I mean, my finger on it. But, uh... <laughs> uh so now we're going to talk about monster ecology. Um, because it's important that we maintain consistency in what we're writing as our speculative fiction known as fantasy... And in particular, grim dark fantasy, a uh, a more sociological, like a social horror, dystopian uh, branch of dark fantasy, uh, as Chet voted on. And I thought that the spider den music in the background, and I mean, shout outs to tabletop audio uh, for it. I thought it might have a little bit more of what I was hoping for. Um, but I was going to use that as a point to say. You know what? We are in a desert. And there's a mountain. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. What if we put giant spiders in the world? You know, every fantasy that's a fantasy has giant spiders as enemies. Do they, though? And even if many do, how appropriate are giant spiders for the setting? Now you might go, oh, come on. That, that, that's a bunch of bull honky, okay? Clearly, Shelob is a giant spider that lives in a desert mountain area. Don't tell me there's no giant spiders in a desert mountain biome. Okay, sure. An ancient, evil, singular shapeshifter that has the form of a giant spider does live in a desert mountain. That's true. And Shelob has an ecosystem. It was actually talked about what she eats and where she lurks. And if you read enough of the, the super nerdy stuff on the side, 
you actually pick up on where Shelob's place is in the world, not just a physical location and dietary needs. Ah, Sierra Echo says, I'd rather we use giant scorpions as beasts of burden. Uh, camel spiders would tend to disagree. Well, in that case, are are we using... Are we using, you know, a big old, uh, like a tarantula? No, tarantulas can live in a desert. But maybe we're drawing on something else. Um, let me go to... Do, do, do. <laughs> we're going to the G section because there's a lot of giant things in the monster manual. Giant ape, giant badger, giant bat, giant centipede. Ooh, a giant centipede could be very interesting as a uh, a caravan, uh, like a one creature caravan. Now this is small, so this giant centipede is only about as large as uh, I don't know, toddler, kindergartner. However, a giant constrictor snake is huge. Huge. Giant crab. Oh, giant eagle! Uh, the grocery store chain here in Ohio is a uh, monster in the Monster Manual. There's a giant scorpion. It's a large beast, so it would be about the size of a horse. And maybe in this instance, Sierra, if we use that as the concept, uh, what would we do with the stinger? Uh, it, is it something where the scorpion isn't exactly driven by the uh, the bit and bridle of a horse? So is there some sort of a rig set up that wherever we're pointing the stinger, the, uh, the scorpion will follow in that direction? Like if we tug on it? See, because this this may not necessarily be a uh, you know a, a desert type. It could be. I mean, we, we can we can fix things on the fly. If you go back to our monster workshop, you'll we could do anything we want. Um, in fact, there's even a giant wolf spider too. But uh, you know, something to think about and have some fun. How can we take what might be expected and and turn it around a little bit? Or instead of even, like, like the giant scorpion, we associate scorpions with uh, d desert atmospheres. Or, like, desert uh, environments. What if there actually was just a, a 15, 20, 25 foot long millipede? Pretty docile. But you can just load it up with a bunch of stuff and only takes one person to drive that uh, biological train over the dunes. You know, just make sure it's fed, I don't know, whatever a giant millipede would eat. But it's it, and, and now you see we're developing a part of the culture for the the humanoid residents. But also, that's the question. What would a giant millipede eat, especially if it was being used as a beast of burden? And, you know, domesticated. Hmm, 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 hmm. So the ecology is going to be what matters, because ghosts, exa for example, you know, very classic monster. In fact, ghosts may very well be in this setting. Ghosts work differently in different settings, you know, between different systems or, you know, a ghost in, in Barovia may operate differently. The zombies do for sure. A, a zombie and a Strahd zombie. And don't even get me started on a Rob zombie. Um, but what's important is that the inhabitants, be they creature or person, we have a place and we can generally address what that is. And the reason for that is world building, if only passively. For example, if we describe a giant millipede or even a giant spider, because many spiders you can keep as pets and they're in the grand scheme of things, rather docile. As long as you know what to look for in their body, uh, in their, you know, behavior, 
Same as a rabbit. I don't know. Are a lot more people scared of rabbits because of getting a rabbit bite? Rabbits bite too. Even though many don't. But if you look for the signs, the agitation or whatever, right? But what that does is that gives the reader of our book cues. So we might shock the reader with a description of a 20 foot long millipede, especially as it crawls up. You know, we, we say, uh, I don't know, we open the scene. There's two children running in the street. Um, one of them falls over. And uh, one of them falls over uh, holding onto the ball. Uh, and um, uh, then looks up and screams as a giant millipede is racing down the road. And it stops. And the person on the millipede says, Hey, kid, get out of the street. I'm driving here. And the, and the millipede comes over. And or, though this would probably be before the reveal, the millipede goes over and like its face opens up and a tongue bleh, and then just licks the cheek of the kid. And then maybe we reveal not even, hey, kid, like, son, what did I tell you about uh, playing ball in the middle of the street? Come on, tell your friend goodbye and hop on the millipede. We're going home. And the millipede is actually like the family pet. It knows the kid. It opened up its face to lick it, not to eat it. Uh, Sirako says, hang a big sun umbrella for the stinger. Uh, it gets bright in the desert. Carrot on a stick to steer the scorpion. Probably not a literal carrot. Scorpion treats on a stick? So it would be like a prisoner on a stick, I guess, if we're talking about a dystopian. <laughs> A prisoner on a stick. If you survive being dangled in front of the scorpion, uh, and the claws or the the stinger, like the, the, don't break out of the harness and get you, then maybe that's your time served. Uh, but until that, uh, until that time, you are the scorpion bait. You're the scorpion bait to drive the the caravan forward, as uh, you have been deemed appropriate meal or at least a lure for the the giant scorpions. Am I not merciful? I let people go if they serve their duty to the country. So let's, uh, we, we have our references. Uh, if you don't have the core rule books, hey, go to your friendly local game store and pick them up. And if you don't have a friendly local game store, let me know and I'll help you get them. All right, our first reference about creating an ecology for our monsters. Why it's important. Of course, consistency is the big word here. During the early years of Dungeons & Dragons, speculative fiction enjoyed something of a fashion for combining science and fantasy. So the popular Pern novels by Anne McCaffrey and Darkover novels by Marion Zimmer Bradley provided scientific explanations for fantasy-flavored worlds of dragons and magic. Meanwhile, in The Magic Goes Away, hard science fiction author Larry Niven treated magic as science and investigated all the, impl uh, all the implications. Readers appreciate these kind of hybrids for a couple of reasons. The injection of science gives magical concepts a boost of plausibility. In some future world, perhaps science really could engineer telepathic dragons, as in Pern. Plus, writers and readers who enjoy explaining things with science's reasoning get to play with fantasy toys. I get it. I've never been entirely satisfied with fantasy that leans too heavily on just because to explain candy houses and winged monkeys. For instance, I keep trying to imagine a scientific, ex uh, a scientific explanation for the long and varying seasons in the world of George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones. Even though I'm confident George has no such e explanation to offer. In Westeros, seasons last for years because it supports theme and story. Winter is coming. Part of what makes fantasy powerful is that not everything needs e explanation. Sometimes fantasy just needs to feel true. 
and sometimes resonate stories uh, come from, uh, I guess, that, wait, and sometimes reson resonant, resonant stories uh, come from mystery. By the way, if you're wondering, why is this magic card here? Oh, that's, uh, that's Nevenerol, uh, Nevenerol's disc. Yeah, Nevenerol's disc. Oh, wait a minute. The magic goes away, inspired by Larry Niven's disc. Larry Niven. Oh, I get it now. It Never Nile is Larry Nevin spelled backwards. That That's old magic trivia, by the way. Anyway, perhaps inspired by the fashion for using science to explain fantastic concepts, Chris Elliott and Richard Edwards took a somewhat silly monster, the Piercer, and wrote The Ecology of the Piercer, which first appeared in the UK fanzine Dragon Lords. The Piercer seems obviously contrived to harass dungeon-crawling PCs, so a dose of science and ecology adds some verisimilitude. Dragon Magazine editor Kim Moha uh, Mohan must have fancied the article's concept because he reprinted the piece in the April and uh, yeah, in April 1983 issue of Dragon. The Ecology series took off and Dragon went on to print more than 150 installments. The Ecology concept improved some monsters, especially those that share the non-magical nature of the Piercer. But adding a dose of science to every prominent creature damaged the assumed world of Dungeons & Dragons. For many monsters, magic provides a better creative basis than science and ecology. Now, this goes on to offer more for you to consider. I'm not going to read the entire article. I want you to visit the site and read the considerations. Monsters that come from magic. Magical creatures that can be evocative in ways that natural creatures cannot. Magical creatures that can break the laws of nature. Embrace the magic in magical creatures. Where else do we see concepts of monster ecology? Thoughtgore, hello! Well, there's a video game some of you may have heard about called Monster Hunter. And Monster Hunter, as the name implies, is a game that allows you to hunt monsters. You go out into the world, you do a little ex uh, exploration, a little preparation perhaps, and then you find the beast that's out there. And... In video games, especially ones that are as as monster-centric as this, you can see that uh, there is care put in, in thought into the environment. Uh, so, I don't know. Let's... Uh, what about the... I don't know a lot of these monsters personally, but let's look up a... Uh, all right, thank you for hanging out, Sierra. A brute Tigrex. A subspecies of Tigrex. These beasts are as brutal as they are ravenous. They prefer volcanic regions, but can be found in a range of areas. Their howls are even more piercing than standard Tigrex roll roars and send shockwaves far and wide. And then we get a little bit into the science that was talked about. It is a flying wyvern. Its closest relatives are... And then here's some others that you can read about and that are connected. We get a habitat range, an ecological niche. The brute tigrex's role as a top predator is no different than that of tigrex. It may hunt uh, Renopolis, Volvidon, Slag, uh, Slagtoth, Oroctor, and Rogi and Great Rogi that live in the lower levels of the volcano. Brute Tigrex are also well known to attack other Tigrex on site. We have biological adaptations behavior. 
Oh, were you, uh, you were playing the, uh, now, are, are you talking the, the classic Nintendo version, uh, Thought Gore, or <laughs> the, the more recent, uh, iteration of it? So here we have, we have, a a, a more compelling reason for this creature to exist. We have more to think about. In our books that we write, are we going to have a page like this? Oh, you could. You could put a uh, a bestiary in the back that has notes. In fact, you might even challenge your reader by having uh, blank entries and to have the reader write down notes that are picked up along the way and have the reader fill in um, as if it were a journal. And if you don't do that, that's fine. Uh, and if you only present it in a more narrative or even in a, a passing way, you have those notes to refer to later or to incorporate small bits here and there so that there's a lot of consistency to your world. Because you know this creature generally exists here and does this, and you know enough that it it has a smooth fit into the world, and you're not going, uh, it's a giant spider. Oh, cool! Uh, wh where are the giant spiders raised? Because we were talking about the, the Pony Express and other things in a, a prior broadcast. Oh, are, are there a series of stables? Uh, for like, like the Pony Express, but for giant spiders? Maybe they help people climb up the mountainside? Oh, wow, that's a good idea. I didn't think of that. Uh, no? I just figured that fantasy places have giant spiders? And that can work, you know, if you're sitting down playing a game with friends. Um, and, you know, they're like, yeah, yeah, you know, let, let's fight it, let's have fun. But if you're going to be composing a novel, there's going to be a little bit higher expectation other than just trust me, bro, or lol what. You can get off uh, on the the excuse of, uh, you know, of that, eh, you know, just trust me, or you might be able to have a one-off of, yeah, I I wanted a spider, I didn't really think about it fitting in there. So, I don't know, for all of you pointed that out, cool on you, but, you know, maybe we won't see it in the future. But, uh, so you, not everything has to be in a complicated Wikipedia-style web of interconnected links, but you can do it that way if you wish. But just look at something like this. These are, so this is some plausible explanations, uh, or maybe even some official stuff that had been printed. But this is what seemingly makes sense for these monsters. Yeah, if we uh, if we come over here too, there's uh, there's little uh, oh so there's some terrestrial life in this expansion to talk about aquatic life. Uh, what what is the copper a uh, kalapa, a creature that feeds on gold fragments dropped by Teroth. Its shell becomes more golden by the year. Oh, all right then. So it's a it's what two sentences. But this backs up this other creature called Teroth. And we have something that actually feeds on the gold. Now that, that begs other questions of what nutrients does it get from it? Or, you know, does it get any? Does it just eat it because it's shiny and it just happens to work? But we're getting... Um, we're getting a feeling for things. And it's still interconnected and we're having consistency. Because if you're aware of Teroth... And this is mentioned in a little uh, a little blurb about a copper kalapa, um, let alone a, oh a gold one. Then, oh wow, so it's not just the great creatures, but the small ones that uh, that can live in a sense together. Very neat. And maybe you want to set up something like this, uh, like the monster hunter uh, the monster hunter wiki. Or other, uh, or other bestiaries that exist. Yes, the OG one. Uh, I, a lot of people find it difficult. Uh, I, I think in part for the controls. It was uh, it has a very unique uh, place in uh, Nintendo Entertainment System game history. Thought Gore. And if you played it, you liked it, and if you is even if you won, congrats on that. Uh, th that's a, a little accomplishment in and of itself.
for the reputation that that game has. Oh, you know what? I didn't, uh... Let's go back here. Because we we put our uh, we put our links right, we share our our uh, bibliography so to speak. Okay. Our next reference. Remember, we let's set up a perimeter of things to think about. That's going to establish our playground of ideas, and we'll bounce around in there. And if we go out of bounds, cool. But at least we have a, a solid uh, base that we can return to. Basic fantasy ecology and making animals. I'm not a biologist or an expert on anything that has ever existed in this universe ever, except for stuff I made up, by any means, but I study it often on my own because I have nothing better to do with my life. I'm going to brief you on the basics of an ecosystem and what a fantasy animal will need to survive, if you're going to go so far as to make up your own animals, and if you're really cool. I tried to fact check as best as I could here, but I'm very bad at explaining things clearly and probably misread something along the way. A large amount of this is recollections of what I learned in biology and zoology classes, backed up by my good friend Wikipedia. So I'll start with niches. In an ecosystem, like a coral reef, a desert, or mountains, wait a minute! Well, the story writes itself, a desert or a mountain. Each animal occupies a set niche. The niche is pretty much what an animal eats and where it lives, its set place in the ecosystem and where it belongs in the food chain. If you knock out an animal's population, its niche will have to be filled by another animal. There's an example for deer. You can read that. Um, and it makes a very good real-world case for what deer are and how they act and what happens, right? Adaptations. All creatures need something such as speed, stealth, size, armor, a weapon, or a combination of those to survive. They have these adaptations to their environments. Cheetahs are a paragon of speed on land, making hunting easier. Cuttlefish change color to blend in with their environments. Elephants survive because they're just too huge for most predators to take down. Rhinos have thick skin like armor. Sharks have jagged teeth for munching on their food and biting whatever tries to bite it. And then we come back. Example, deer are actually quite dangerous when sufficiently enraged. E uh, example, cheetahs can run faster than you and your grandma. So you can read through the examples. I'm, I, I will let you get into the minutia of the article, but I want to get the ideas out to you here. Now, what about the food chain? If you didn't pay attention in school, I'll give you a quick rundown of how the food chain operates, using a simple example in the forest environment. If you remove a step or two, the intricate balance is lost. So it starts with the sun, uh, you know, comes down, energizes, feeds the plants, uh, grass is devoured mercilessly, the, de the deer is devoured mercilessly, uh, and then the deer is devoured merc mercilessly. And uh, wouldn't you know, uh, as in The Lion King, uh, you know, you become the grass again, and the cycle begins anew. Uh, the deer eat you, you eat the deer. The grass eat you, the deer eat the grass. The lions eat the deer. Uh, the grass eats the lions, and so on and so forth. But having an understanding of this um, is is great. You Again, you may not need to be intricate with every creature, but know enough to be dangerous and to have them... Be a part of, uh, of the world you're creating. When making a fantasy creature, think of its habitat and niche. What, uh, which kind of animals live in that habitat? What niche will this fantasy creature belong to? What does it eat? Will it kick out the native population of creatures of that same niche? Because after all... You can't have a lot of one kind of ruminant and a lot of another kind of ruminant in a small area. If the habitat is too small, then one of them is going to have to go. Example, dragons. Let's go to a mountainous environment and pretend that's where dragons live. A dragon is a carnivore, so it would probably push back any other carnivores, such as mountain lions, into other parts of the mountains, 
because what chance has a mountain lion got against a dragon? Also, a dragon also usually has to have a lot of territory because it's so huge. Salamanders, yes, the fictional kind, live in fire. Yes, fire. If a fantasy creature lives in a normally inhospitable environment like fire, you don't have to worry about niche. The salamander has an unconquerable niche in the fantasy setting unless you happen to create another type of fire-dwelling creature. Real salamanders would die if you put them in a fire, so please don't do that. Uh, now I'm going to walk you through two different creatures I made up. One is a Sordolphin, and the other is an annoying flower bug. The Sordolphin. I had to make up some kind of animal to live in the ocean of an Earth-like world. What kind of animals live in the ocean? According to the primordial soup theory, life itself began in the ocean, so there must be a lot of creatures there. The ocean covers nearly three quarters of the world. Uh, the diversity of life in the sea is quite wide. Sponges, whales, hydras, sea lions, fish, worms, sea slugs, starfish, coral. I decided to base the creature on a dolphin, but it would be like 30 feet long instead. I gave it a small but sharp, or I gave it small but sharp teeth and a long nose like a marlin's. And I had it practice the same hunting technique as a marlin. Hit a fish with its nose and while it's stunned, go scoop up the fish in its mouth. I also gave it two dorsal fins, uh, like uh, Giglioli's whale, a characteristic that does not occur on any known animal. The Sordolphin occupies the niche of Eater of Big Fish. I made it a solitary animal, only gathering together to mate with the uh, mother uh, Eaters of Big Fish, taking care of their baby monsters until they're big enough to survive on their own. I figured these creatures would have a lifespan of maybe 20 years, and they made a few times over the course of their lives. It's essentially a giant mammalian swordfish. The, uh, the animals that would probably not be around are other kinds of dolphins, carnivorous smallish whales, and maybe marlins. And what about the annoying flower bug? I wanted to bother the people that lived in the farming village at the feet of some large mountains, but I didn't want to set a plague on them. So I went with making a type of beetle that eats grain and is often found in the flour mills. I don't know a lot about beetles because frankly there's too many of them, but they have quite a few things in common. They all have a tough exoskeleton that doesn't protect them from the bottoms of your shoes coming down hard upon their backs, but it prevents ants and things from nibbling on their soft innards. They have antennae that they use to feel around and all have six legs. A lot of them can fly. So, I'm, uh, so my made-up beetle, I said, would be smallish and a bit easy to completely miss if you aren't looking for it. It would maybe be the color of the grain it's so fond of. So I made it vaguely the size of grain, a grain of wheat and darker than a grain of wheat. Just enough to blend in. I also made its antennae a bit small so it could blend in even more with its food. And for good measure, I gave it wings and they reproduce by having their eggs fertilized and buried in some loose earth near food until the little baby beetles hatch and crawl out of the dirt. Now the people of the village have a pest to look out for, and I'm going to have the farmers hire people in the village to pick out the beetles and squish them for a quick buck. Unfortunately, some got overlooked and probably turned into flour. You always wonder, is that a burnt rice crispy? And not an FDA-approved minimum amount of... Uh, well, we'll leave that be. So, here are... A porpoise with a purpose. And also, hi, Goblin of Gigaxenor. So, here are some examples. And you might go, this is ridiculous. An, an annoying flower bug. I would never put this in my novel. And I would never make it into a D&D &D monster for... A, uh, a tactical uh, war simulation role-playing game. Okay, cool. But you get the idea. Now take the concept, take the idea, and apply it to whatever fantastical thing you want to create. Or even something as mundane as the flower bug. This is a thing that belongs in this world. It has a purpose, uh, both uh, in the narrative and in the world broadly. And... It's compelling enough to cause some kind of action or an impetus for something to occur. 
And lastly, yes, yes, it does. Uh, Goblin of Gag Axanor, it, it does. Uh, apparently, I, I've been having something creep up on me. And lastly, if you want a very interesting... If you wanted a very interesting way to look at the ecologies of creatures, uh, may I introduce you to the SCP Foundation. Secure, Contain, Protect. This is a list of all kinds all kinds of uh, unique monsters that have articles written about them. Uh, that place them into the world. It talks about their behaviors. Uh, it talks about their qualities. And you maybe you borrow an idea... Uh, that is similar to the SCP Foundation's uh, inhabitants. Um, you do something direct or indirect. But this gives you a, a very good way, especially because it references other creatures and things too, to learn about ecologies. And very interesting and especially niche ones. There are some very... There are some very niche uh, SCPs. And uh, I, I appreciate that uh, the SCP Foundation is very much a writing exercise uh, in its uh, in its heart, um, and that some of them are, as a story, you know, well composed. And you go, that's very super duper specific. <laughs> um, but also, why couldn't it exist? Anyway, there's many, many different uh, SCPs out here to read. Uh, find one that looks good to you. What, what might be compelling? Read them all. There's plenty of channels on YouTube that will read over uh, SCP articles, will narrate things, or, you know, have an illustration. Um, you know, if you want to read about the Brittle Boy um, or the Time Crow Wave, you can do that. And maybe this is, uh, it, it's that reference you needed to get things organized in your world from mundane and not all SCPs are harmful. Um, there are some that are, I mean, they're categorized, um, but it's, you know, it may not necessarily hurt or kill people. All right. Now that we have discussed this part, uh, Surgeon Crabs, let's let's look at some references, uh, some pop culture references to back up what we have just read over on these sites in these articles. Uh, I, I'm not going to start with that one just yet. We're going to start with this. What a horrible way to die. Hello, my name is Dr. Anton Jessup, and I'm curator of monster studies here at the university. You always find me down here in the university basement because of late I've taken something of a, an unofficial residency. Shh. But back to these marvelous creatures. You may find it a bit grotesque, but I simply cannot look away. These winged devourers haunt strange woods. They worship the eagle, and they boast one of the more ingenious feeding methods ever witnessed. Let's take a closer look. 
tall, gaunt, bipedal, winged. The monsters depicted in the Beastmaster are unique anatomical specimens, even among other unnatural creatures. For starters, their large bat-like wings grant them at least limited flight, an impressive feat for such a large organism. But their wings have another purpose, to capture and hold human prey. Once the victim is secured, the devourer vomits a corrosive solvent all over the squirming meal's head. It's a form of external digestion, which you've also seen in spiders, the common housefly, or the extremely rare brundlefly. You break down food in the acidic pit of your stomach, while these creatures perform the same process outside of the body. Once regurgitated, the deadly vomit sinks in for a few moments, liquefying flesh right off the unfortunate victim's bones. Then our devourer sucks the grotesque soup right back into its gullet for a tasty meal. Finally, the creature simply throws open its wings and lets the indigestible remnants of bone and armor crumple to the ground. Such a beautiful organism. It lacks the necessary jaws for masticating flesh, and therefore it has to liquefy its meals for easy consumption. Now, no natural world vertebrate eats quite like this, but luckily for us, there's still plenty of regurgitation to go around. Bats and birds both vomit to feed their young. The proboscis monkey regurgitates and rechews its food. Vultures, meanwhile, use it as a defensive measure. And in this, we find some fascinating answers. Some scientists theorize the vulture's defensive vomit is meant to intimidate would-be predators or even burn them with stomach acid. Still, others think that they choose such moments to lighten the load for emergency takeoff. However, the more tantalizing theory sees the regurgitated heat of partially digested carrion as a bribe. Why eat me, the vulture asks, when you can have all of this? But the turkey vulture's vomit is still highly acidic, powerful enough to break down rancid corpse flesh and the toxic bacteria therein. This may provide the strongest clue to the winged devourer's evolutionary past. Once scavenging avians, they cruised for carrion and scoffed it down on sight. Then, over the course of their evolution, they developed a new way to utilize their powerful digestive juices. Their jaws atrophied, and they learned to employ a very human mode of external digestion, cooking. They simply boil those indigestible bones down into a delicious, slurpable stew. Now, you may find all of this a bit grotesque. But doesn't it make you wish that human vomit was more interesting? That we could use it offensively or defensively, say, on the train? I know I do. Sadly, I have to leave you now. But in the meantime, I hope that you'll let me know what other monsters you would like for me to dissect for you. I'll be waiting to hear from you. So, similar to what we had referenced. Also, uh, Urantz, thank you for coming in on the raid. Armin, uh, great to see you, my friend. Uh, we're going over monster ecology as a way to provide consistency in your fantasy world. And uh, we, we had talked about um, uh, different references going over ways that you can think about your ecology uh, of monsters that you choose to have in your world. Examples. And uh, the last site we looked at was uh, the Secure uh, Contain and Protect Foundation, SCP Foundation. And now we, we're going into pop culture references, not merely reading about the concepts. We're seeing this put in action in ways that maybe are, are more identifiable to some of you out there. So Armin, uh, you recognize that this was from the Beastmaster. Now, what about a another... Uh, how can we describe the behavior or is the whatever the environment of other animals here's another example you all may know okay. don't be scared come on it's okay we'll do track the life for me she's sick
Disorientation, labored breathing. It seems to happen about every six weeks or so. Six weeks. This is dilated. They Take are? a look. It's okay. I'll be damned. It's pharmacological from local plant life. Lilac? Yes. We know they're toxic, but the animals don't eat them. You sure? Pretty sure. There's only one way to be positive. I'd have to see the dinosaurs dropping. Dino... Droppings? Droppings? storm center hasn't dissipated or changed course. We're gonna have to cut the tour short, I'm afraid. Pick it up again tomorrow where we left off. Are you sure we have to? It's not worth taking the chance, Johnny. Well, sustain winds 45 knots. when they get back in the cars. Yeah. Get off. Ladies Thanks, and gentlemen, Steve. last shuttle leaving for the dock leaves in approximately five minutes. Drop what you're doing and leave now. One big pile of shit. You're right. There's no trace of lilac berries. It's so odd, though. All right. So she's suffering from heliotoxicity every six weeks. We'll see. Rats. She's a. Tenacious. You have no idea. You will remember to wash your hands before you eat anything. All right. Have you ever thought about the monsters of your world pooping? Now, maybe not directly the act, but what do they eat? And can they get sick or be poisoned for... Uh, other than like, oh, poison damage. This scene cements uh, this scene. And by the way, this is also good for clues. If if you have a party that's looking to investigate something and they find clues like droppings or something else. This cements the dinosaurs in this world that not only are they alive, which is clear. They eat. And they also don't eat things, but some things get them sick or make them sick. Or, as uh, as we learn, that they're supposed to have a dependence on uh, mm, lycopene, I think. If any of you are nerds out there, uh, all the dinosaurs were supposed to be reliant on... Uh, on a chemical or a vitamin. I, I forget exactly. Uh, it was like lyco something. Um, in order to make sure that if they escape, they will not survive because they have to be fed or have plants specifically with this. But this shows that the animals are a part of this world. A part of this world. They eat, they poop, they get sick. They... Lay eggs? Ooh. Hmm. Well, <laughs> uh-oh. And the final, the final piece of pop culture reference, uh, you know, getting into behaviors and uh, patterns and maybe especially 
niches. Now, the dinosaurs were manufactured or inserted into the world. What, ab what about the ecological niche does a particular monster or other creature have? Let's see an example of a monster with a niche ecosystem. Armin says, the same idea is incorporated in the living dungeon approach. Dungeon denizens have lives that are separate from the PCs. Yeah, it's not always as easy as kicking in the door and there's a goblin. You go to the next room down the hallway, you kick in the door and there's a vampire. Okay, well, they're fun fights, but how does that work? It's good to see you're okay. Do I even want to know? What did uh, hi Rose Wolf? What did we learn about these monsters? Now, if you're familiar with the broader movie, it, it's okay to talk about that too. If you're not, do you think? Do you think that we learned enough from this clip that this is some sort of a unique species, and what are its qualities? What's its niche? Did we learn how they act or what they do, what they're capable of doing? Did any of you watch this movie, I wonder? Of course, this is also a prequel movie to... Uh, Another another uh, series of them that had uh, Vin Diesel in it. Big D and D buff uh, that he is as well. The audience is shy. Also, yeah, hi, hi, Rose Wolf. What did we see? Oh, is this what dark vision looks like? Kind of, but definitely we get to see. Yep, the uh, the Chronicles of Riddick. We get to see what they see. How do they sense? They appear to avoid light. They look like kind of winged bipedal hammerhead sharks. In fact, 
it's a little difficult to see. You can just barely make them out here at the edge of the ring of light. And they're hungry. They swoop in. And we get over to this character who can see in the dark. And now we get a little bit clearer vision. What do they eat? How do they eat? How do they behave? It looks like they are... Uh, that, you know, they are contesting each other. They fight. They have some sort of maybe a hierarchy. See, look, that one was just a... Boom, boom, boom. Whether for feeding, or maybe it's some sort of a mating ritual. And now we see that they're they're coming together, and they want to stalk the others. Ah, clever girls. And we also saw a little bit of behavior. Look. Did you notice? And what did I talk about earlier with anything from handling a rabbit to handling a tarantula? Both of them are capable of biting. Both of them don't necessarily want to bite you. But if you understand what, you'll learn more about them. I need a shy chat emote, everyone. Which, I wonder which, uh, which mascot should I have uh, be a shy emote, or a shy chat emote? Their body language, and perhaps even the sounds that they make. What do we see? Tails up when they're feeding or the aggressive behavior. That one, look, tail down, it's just walking. This, and so this one's, they had tails kind of down. This one comes over. Did you see? Attention, interest. Maybe it's a sensory organ or a way to sense or indicate or communicate. We may not speak their squeaks and, and, you know, haunting sounds, but we can see that they're, they're doing something all the same. Something's happening, or something will happen because of the way that they're behaving. These are small elements to your monsters that fit in the ecosystem that provide consistency to your fantasy world and are all a part of that framework of escapism and entertainment that we hope to glean, even in a grim, dark setting that you all wanted to, to write up for our NaNoWriMo exercise. These little things can make a big difference, can make things cohesive and coherent. And so knowing aspects of the monsters like this, heck, even if we go back, this is, again, bread and butter, here's the monster manual, and here is, here's a giant spider. There we go. It is CR1. This is a classic fantasy monster. You would be doing this thing a disservice as either a dungeon master or, you know, GM or storyteller. And especially as an author... If all you say is a pink and orange giant spider comes out and bites the character. Does that happen? Yes, that is that is the literal explanation of what happened. Is that compelling to read? If you're not providing the details, are we supposed to be afraid of the spider? You just call it a giant spider. Am I supposed to know as a reader that even though you may be basing this on D&D, &D, how big is it? I mean, you say giant. This says large. 
large can mean a lot of, th I mean, in a range, but a lot of things in even Dungeons and Dragons. So what if you say uh, the spy uh, a spider the size of a horse crawls out of uh, an impossibly narrow nook, fangs dripping? Well, now we can see, we, we get a sense of size and its capabilities, and we're getting body language, we're getting behavior. It's salivating or dripping or producing venom ready to go. And we can still include the action of the adventurers being attacked. But the behavior is a part of that character. And the spider is a character. Even if the spider is only there for three pages of a 300, 400 uh, page novel. It is still a character and you should treat it as such. And that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> As we imagine the magic and the monsters of the region we've created together here. And I think it's coming along together very, very nicely.